Thanks, Justin. So <clears throat> Columbia Tech Ventures is Columbia's tech commercialization office that works with university researchers to take inventions to their marketplace. With over 400 new inventions, this goes to our office every year, and 25 new startups that form from that flow of inventions, along with all the other great innovations and startups that come from our undergraduates and graduates who are inspired by being on our campus in this city. We were very fortunate to work at sort of the cross-section of where this thriving research and entrepreneurship community come together. We are part of five technology lab to market accelerators with three new to launch this year that cover every sort of impactful uh, technology sector that we have today. Um, many of these are in partnership with other leading academic institutions in the city, such as NYU and the New School, all of which is meant to support the founders that are coming from our academic camp campuses here in the city. Along with NYU, Columbia is one of the founding members of the New York City Media Lab. And speaking on behalf of our office, we are always full of pride to see the work, the great work that Justin and his team has done to expand the influence of the New York City Media Lab here in the city and also abroad. This is personified more in, in the programs that they've launched, such as the Combine, which you'll hear about more later today, and the ARVR Center, all of which are meant in some way to bring together industry, education, research, technology in a way in New York that impacts all of us. Our, key, our keynote, the CEO of a company that personifies what can happen when groundbreaking technology, talented founders, and a vision come together um, to form something towards human-computer interaction. Control Labs is a man-based startup that makes neural interfaces, which are devices that translate uh, neural activity into digital action. The company calls this intention capture, building products at the intersection of computation, neuroscience, biophysics, machine learning, and hardware all towards redefining what we think of as humans interacting with machines. <clears throat> with top flight investors such as Lux Capital and Matrix Partners are all aligned with Control Lab's mission, a world where computers are just natural extensions of our thought and movement. We are fortunate to have the CEO of Control Labs, Thomas Reardon, give the keynote address at our summit today, who has already had a long and diverse career before Control Labs. He was a creator of the Internet Explorer project at Microsoft, before, found it, before becoming the co-founder and CEO of Avogadro, a wireless networking company that was acquired by Openware, where he was OpenWave, where he was CTO. This is all before his college career. He completed a liberal arts degree in classics at Columbia University and ended his education, at least for now, uh, with a PhD in neuroscience from Thomas Chessel's lab in at Columbia University. In control labs, I think we can see each of these experiences in the DNA of the company. Please welcome Thomas Reardon. Greetings. Uh, I want to talk to you about Control Labs and the novel breakthrough work we're doing on a new kind of neural interface. Um, we started the company to address this problem, this yawning gap that machines and computers expose between human input and human output. You have a phenomenal ability to take in information in the world, visually, auditorially, from touch, and, and, and proprioceptively as you move around. You're actually pretty terrible at output. And every new wave of machines and experiences exposes this deeper and deeper problem. Uh, this is probably five orders of magnitude if you measured it in some scientifically uh, uh, cohesive way. We want to break through this and expose human output at the same level as your input stream. Um, and we want to do that in a way that isn't just about sort of this abstract notion of increasing your bandwidth, but also uh, increases your facility. I, I love this picture because it, it mixes together this suicide act of this person trying to text while driving um, with driving itself. Now, driving is actually kind of an enjoyable output task. It's something you do by moving. You need some feedback to control it. It's actually very pleasurable. Texting, especially since 2008 with the iPhone, is a damn frustrating experience. We regressed as a species in 2008. It's not like we're more facile with the phone. I want to make typing, text production, controlling anything around you, robots in an industrial setting or in a home setting, your immersive experiences in VR and AR. I want those to feel as fluid and easy as driving, something you learn naturally and adaptively. Um, I wanted to talk to this audience in particular about this. So some of you 
are, may not be old enough to remember uh, the introduction of the IBM PC in the early 80s. Um, what I thought was funny was IBM's choice to use the Charlie Chaplin capture, uh, 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 character, uh, the tramp, to introduce it, to kind of humanize it, when it's actually, you know about Chaplin, who's like, had a, made a whole career out of sort of making fun of technology. Uh, and there it is with that keyboard. There was no mouse. It was basically a 19th century device, vaguely updated. Uh, and then, of course, in more recent times, we had the uh, 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 first attempt to kind of show a popular version of immersive experiences or an, an artificial reality experience, an augmented reality experience with Tom Cruise in, uh, in Minority Report. And here, uh, one of the apocryphal stories, perhaps, is that he had to shut down filming during that movie after about an hour of filming and doing all of this crazy stuff because his arms were too tired. We call it gorilla arms from basically running a spreadsheet. That's not the kind of immersive experience we really want. We want you to have high facility and we want it to feel effortless, not effortful. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how I think, how we map out how you actually work in the world today and how you work with devices and computers today. Your brain, this forebrain up here, is actually really a lot bigger than just that. It's connected to your spinal cord. And your spinal cord is what carries information out to your muscles. Motor neurons up in the forebrain connect to those lower motor neurons in the spinal cord and they turn muscles on and off. And that's how you move in the world. But then further, that's how you actually interact with digital experiences with mice and keyboards and, and a touch screen or a connect as you move around or even a microphone. All of those are just mechanical transducers. They take your movement, which is very slow, and transduce that to something that allows you to control this myriad field of digital devices, digital experiences. Whether it's VR, whether it's a robot or a drone, whether it's the IoT thermostat on the wall. We think there's a better way in a more general way of approaching this problem of control, of increasing your facility and increasing your output. And we call it intention capture. And yes, that's specifically meant to evoke motion capture. So I wanna give you a hint of how intention capture works. I'll go a little bit deeper on it, and then we're gonna show you some demos of actually how we do it. So what if instead of actually building these devices that transduce our movement in the world, instead, we actually just listen to the electrical activity of those motor neurons, those neurons that are turning muscles on and off, and we directly translate that into control over devices. Just get those intermediate devices out of the way. Get the muscles out of the way. Your neurons are crazy fast and crazy high bandwidth. That's what we tap into. It allows us to now imagine new kinds of interaction that go beyond your actual physical body. What it would be like to have six fingers or what it would be like even further to, to kind of get way out there and say, what would it be like to have eight arms and to control them as if you were an octopus? The only way to do that is to tap into the immense capacity embedded in your brain, but which is constrained by your muscles. So I'm gonna go into how we do it here. I'm gonna do a little bit of neurobiology. So, uh, we have to decide what kind, what, what kind of neural interface do we want to go do. We decided first, we're not going to go and drill into the skull and listen to neurons up there. But what we did want to do is take advantage of something about motor cortex, which is that, and I showed you the brain there, and now this is a slice and a view on the other axis to look at the way cortex is arranged. And this is a famous picture called the motor homunculus. And what this does is it, it gives you a sense of how much of your brain is dedicated to, how, to what parts of your body. And within this, you'll notice the largest density of neural output from your brain actually goes to your hands. The second most goes to your mouth. But your hands are the most skillful part of you. That shouldn't be that surprising to many people here. And it actually, the input to your hands from your brain dwarfs any other part of your body. It allows us to put this device on the wrist and actually extract the highest density of nervous signals in your body. Uh, so we take that down, those motor neurons in the motor cortex, again, project down to the spine. Those, in turn, relay to motor neurons in the spine. These are the single neurons, the largest cells in your entire body. It goes all the way out, courses out, connects onto the muscle, and we're detecting it by the electrical response of the, of the, of the muscle. And what we do is we have this array of electrodes here. 
And we're able to deconvolve this very complex mixed signal into the component signals, which are the individual activity of individual muscles. And from that, we basically get a map of anything you would normally do in the world, whether that's typing on a keyboard, swiping on a phone, moving a mouse around. That's all done by some combination of actions of individual muscles in the hand. There happen to be 14 in the arm that control your hand. Well, that's kind of interesting, but that just allows us to effectively virtually recreate everything you do today in the world. What we really want to do is go a little bit deeper. Inside the muscle are actually connections from hundreds of motor neurons, and this is the neurobiology I was warning you about. So when you actually go into the spinal cord, you'll notice there are these three motor neurons in the spinal cord, and they're connected to the muscle, the single muscle. And actually, there's fibers in the muscle that receive input from a single motor neuron, these red ones, the blue ones, the purple ones. That collection is called a motor unit. Whenever a motor neuron is active in the spinal cord, it sends off something called an action potential. It's the zero and one of the nervous system. It's how the code is generated. Whenever that zero or one is sent from the spinal cord, that cluster of muscle fibers all respond at the exact same time. And with very clever signal processing, and ML algorithms were able to actually separate out not just muscle from muscle, but neuron from neuron. So that now I no longer have to think about my muscles controlling my hand. I can now think about hundreds of neurons reassigned to control anything. The last thing I'm going to do is try to marry this to uh, an ML con uh, concept that I'm going to try for, with you for the first time. The goal here is not just to capture the motion that would result from the activity of a neuron. We want to capture the underlying intention. And you'll hear me say again and again, we don't care about the movements you make. We care about the neural signals underlying what would be movements. The heart of this, uh, and what our company is basically a staff buyer, machine learning scientists who are taking the signals from individual motor neurons, which exist in their own network, and directly feeding those into a synthetic neural network, a DNN, if you will. And those neurons, try to, these synthetic neurons, try to create a mapping to your intention. That intention would be me moving up or down, or moving the cursor up or down. But now, try to take that to a more complex space, which we'll show you in these videos in a moment. And what we're trying to take advantage of here is not just grabbing your intention, but giving you the feedback, just like that steering wheel would, the feedback that allows you to rapidly train yourself to control a new thing that doesn't have any mapping to your body whatsoever. We call that adaptation, and that's really kind of the secret sauce embedded in our technology. This ability for this artificial neural network to drive feedback to your nervous system and get into a tight feedback loop such that your neurons are directly computing, are directly interacting with an artificial neural network, which is then directly feeding back to you and allowing you to gain rapid control. So we say that intention capture allows us to decode the activity of real neurons, your neurons, your motor neurons, using digital neurons. We have two different kinds of control we talk about. We talk about myocontrol and then neurocontrol. Myocontrol is when you're moving. Neurocontrol could be when you're moving, but it's really just the activity of your neurons. Myocontrol allows us to redo anything you would today virtually. Type, move a mouse, move a joystick, drive a car. Neurocontrol allows us to be an octopus. So we say that Myocontrol is how we derive meaning from movement. So I'm going to show you now the demo part of this talk. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is show you our ability just from muscle mapping, how we can create a virtual hand. And what I want you to focus on isn't just that we can do like a gesture recognizer, is the hand open or closed, but the full continuous motion of the hand. Uh, this is a comically difficult problem. Uh, and it's really like I said, the full dynamic range of motion, individuation of fingers, et cetera. Um, you can see a device on my wrist there. It's an older device. Now, 
The reason we did this hand is because we thought, well, I should say this. This is what we mean by intention now. Notice, I'm able to move the hand. My hand's not moving at all. It only cares about the nerve and what the nerve is telling the machine to do. Here it's doing the forces that I'm generating. No camera could ever decode this. We actually can do this across pinches. We calculate the forces across all the joint angles. Of course, the reason we did this work for a hand and a virtual hand is because we think it's critical. It's the entry point for immersive computing experiences in augmented reality and virtual reality. Your hands are the most skillful part of you. That's why we want them back in VR. Um, here I'm going to show you uh, a little bit more abstract. Um, what we're doing here is showing you like, that you don't have to actually move to do any of this stuff. He's moving around here, and we call these uh, Star Wars hands. He's got this little cursor he's moving that's mapped to his wrist. And instead of actually moving to kind of play with these objects and move them around, he's just doing sort of like a Star Wars emperor thing. He's just like slowly flexing his hand and getting control over these objects. We want to have this sense of empowerment for you, that you get magical control over things, even when they're at a distance. It's not the things that are just in front of you. We want you to learn a whole new kind of control, not the control you learned when you were a year old stacking blocks, but instead, if you were a Jedi, trying to stack blocks a mile away from you. This was uh, from about a year ago. This is our first effort to do typing. I think that's me you can see. Uh, uh, trying to say all your interface are, belong to us. This is the future. Now, that were examples of some myocontrol, where we're ma mapping that out to muscles, and not just the movements, but the tensions that go into the muscles. This thing that we really never leverage in computing experiences today. Here we're doing something way more ab abstract. I don't know if the sound can be brought up on the, on the presentation, but if it can, please bring it up. Um, so here, this is my co-founder, Patrick Kaifosh, another Columbia neuroscientist, and he's not moving. You have to trust me that there's a band on his wrist right there, but he's playing asteroids on a phone, the old arcade game Asteroids. So this is a game that has two and a half degrees of freedom. You have to push buttons. You have to fly around, change the thrust vectors, move left and right at different speeds. Uh, and he has full control when he's not moving. He spent about 60 seconds training the machine. I want to emphasize this. This is not you learning how to control. This is you telling a machine how you want to control it. And that is the fundamental thing we've screwed up for the last century in our interactions with machines. Constantly improving the machines and asking us to learn them, not the other way around. Neurocontrol starts at the premise that you train a machine. I think this is exotic, and if your minds are not blown by that, and a person not moving. I will tell you, sometimes this is the worst technology in the world to demo because it's just a video of a person not moving. Uh, <laughs> But that, that should be the ultimate goal. This is uh, our work to map this to different robotics. And here's the first biomimetic one, and then I'll show you an abstract one after this. This is Adam Berenzweig, also a Columbia scientist, uh, uh, and doing a little hexapod and mapping it for full continuous control over these things. Uh, now, the nice thing here is, again, you can move that hexapod. <laughs> uh, you can move a hexapod with just a joystick, but why would you do that? What you really want to do is do all six fingers, but you only have five. Well, that's where neurocontrol comes through. We can solve that problem somewhat trivially. This is him uh, taking care of himself, as he should, with a seven degree of freedom, $50,000 Canova arm as a back scratcher. Uh, there we go. <laughs> uh, And the next one, oh, this is just a little continuation of that, where he's doing object manipulations. And you can think of this as, how would you train a robot to do something? One of the hottest topics in robotics is, is pick and place. And uh, one of the hotter topics is actually having them imitate humans and learn from humans about how to do things. Here, we're mixing biomimetic action, the movements that he's doing, with things that are more synthetic. Remember, that thing has like a 360 degree rotation across each joint. A human body can't do that. He can still control it through all of those motions because of neurocontrol. 
because we're not trying to just map to what your hand is doing. We do a mapping to what your neurons do, and we basically don't care about this little device at the end of your arm. We care about what your neurons are doing. Uh, I want you to imagine for a second where we're going with this technology. Obviously, we'd like it to be something that just follows you around all day. It's just part of you, integrated into you, or onto you, I should say. Uh, the goal is for you to be the universal controller, not to have a universal controller. I want you to imagine like your phone just being a dumb screen as opposed to something you have to actually do something to, but where you have incredibly fine control over everything it's potentially capable of doing. It would be nice to actually write something on, an, on a phone rather than jot down a 10-word message because I've run out of steam. Uh, I want you to imagine what it would be like to actually have, say, you know, a new Apple Watch where you're just one-handed writing a quick message there. You're not talking to it. You're not having to type. You're just doing it out of one hand quickly and then moving on to your next goal. This should be always available. The keyboard should be you. You shouldn't have to go learn 52 different keyboards. I will tell you that typing thing that we showed you earlier is actually really fun. It was crazy to have it like, experience it the first time. And it really feels like it's your personal keyboard, like something you've never experienced before. Uh, we imagine, uh, uh, there we, I said we imagine uh, a new kind of productivity application. Imagine an architect working in AutoCAD, but instead of going to the palette sequentially to pick different interactions, instead they're blending all kinds of modalities together, the color picker and a rotation scheme all at the same time and simultaneously with full high fidelity control. I think this has enormous implications both for productivity but also just the joy of work making it human-centric. So, I'll leave you with this. I'd ask you, what would you do? What would you dream about if you had more control? More control over devices, where you didn't submit to them, but they submitted to you. Uh, we're control labs. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are actually shipping this technology to developers in January. Uh, you should go to our site and uh, sign up for Developer Kit if you are super interested in it. If you're a student, you should submit a job application. Uh, we, are, we are recruiting uh, aggressively. We're a company of 45 people. We are very well funded. Uh, we are looking for the best machine learning, neuroscience, and design thinkers in the world. Um, thanks much. Take a seat. Oh, thank you. That was okay. I'll shake your head up. So. Reardon, thank you. That was, uh, I, I, I was looking at the demos last night, at least what I see online, and the progress you've made is just, just incredible for the field. Yeah, it's not continuous progress. It's very discontinuous. We had to, uh, you know, there's just these giant steps, first from the hardware, when we finally get the hardware dialed in, so it was much... Uh, it was sort of invulnerable or less vulnerable to noise. These, these lights are a disaster for us, but we've actually created some pretty sophisticated technology to, to shield ourselves from the kind of environmental noise. Your body is a giant antenna uh, that we're always trying to work around. Uh, but the signals that you generate are actually enormous. And uh, like I said, we make these big leaps in functionality from a year ago. The, this technology would be unrecognizable from what you see today. Hell, that's true for six months ago. So I wanted to sort of continue, uh, sort of a little extension of the talk you just gave. Um, as a non-expert like myself, I think it's easy to conflate BMI versus BCI. And so I thought maybe you could spend a little time sort of discussing how you define those differences and where Control Lab sits. So I, I don't want to pretend that there's a field called brain machine interfaces or brain computer interfaces. Um, it, you know, there are people working in labs across the world who are predominantly focused on how do we go help people who have motor pathologies, like gross motor loss. They either have ALS or Parkinson's or some other profound motor loss that keeps them from being able to use these legacy technologies. And for them, a tiny little bit of functionality, like being able to move a mouse cursor, can completely change their lives. It gives them agency all over again. We'll call that the brain-machine interface world. We don't really see a difference from our perspective between what's called BCI and BMI. It's kind of a false dichotomy. Um, they, they effectively mean the same thing. Uh, we think BMI is a better term because 
I, I really want to get across, this is technology for controlling everything. I want to control the thermostat on the wall as badly as I want to control a hexapod and make it go get me a glass of wine. Um, we don't use either of those terms for ourselves. We use the term neural interface. Um, because we're interfacing with, the, with, with really what's called the peripheral nervous system, and we have a lot of reasons why we believe that is the most important place to interface. It is the natural output of your brain. That's where you evolved to control the world. Um, and rather than kind of get gummed up by this 1950s science fiction view that all of your thinking happens up here and the rest of the brain is just sort of there waiting for commands, instead we say, well, let's, Let's just call it a neural interface for now, and that got gummed up in this, in this argument about what is consciousness and where does your will live, et cetera. We know what evolution gave you, which is the ability to move your body and control your hands via motor neurons. That's what we interface with, so we call it neural interfaces. So in, in, in that sense then, you know, now with Control Labs releasing SDKs and a kit this year, what would you say to the developers in the audience who are thinking of applications they'd want to design in the context you just explained? The number one thing I'd say is forget the past. Um, my experience as a you know, grizzled old technologist all the way back to the 80s uh, is that most startups and most companies think they're succeeding because they do something called translational technology. They, they bring a technology to market that plugs a gap that was op exposed by some existing technologies, but they do it in some translational way. So it's, uh, I would show you that keyboard that I had right there. Well, to the extent that that's like a QWERTY keyboard, I'm just trying to map to the past. But that's not what's really exciting. What's really exciting is a keyboard that doesn't really require me to move and I can generate words as fast as I can speak just using one hand. I don't want to give away too much, but that's our goal. Um, so try to forget the past, don't try to create these translational experiences. I'd say where, where a lot of startups get gummed up is thinking that that first success, because people are hungry for the translational ones, it's those are the ones they understand, is, is the right launching point. And what really ends up happening is that people end up getting into a corner that they can't get out of with their businesses or with their projects or with their products, uh, where you're only addressing the legacy problem, but you're not really trying to look at the future. So in terms of control labs and developers, should there be concerns now on sort of the social kind of impacts of this on, on the consumer? Any privacy issues that people should think about early on? Um, how does it affect how you position your business? So, you know, I, I'm somebody who thinks of the contemporary mobile phone world as just an unmitigated social disaster. Um, you, many of you may disagree with that, but that's what I think. So I, I like to think about technologies that can sort of break the lock and, and make us more social again. Um, I, I would say I, it's hard for me to imagine a way in which the technology we're bringing to bear isn't more humanizing. Uh, the question is, are you really starting with this attitude of enhancing human output, human power, human control, or are you trying to force people to learn how to manipulate a machine, an increasingly complex machine? Uh, that's where I want to drive us. The more control we have, the more energy, the more cognitive energy we have to be the social animal that we are fundamentally. Like I said, it takes effort to type on a phone. It takes a tremendous amount of effort. Like you have to correct the autocorrector. <laughs> What's left to actually be social at that point? Um, so I, I'm, well, I'll leave it there. Is, there. is there an industry you have in mind that you think this should, we should avoid right now? Is there, is there a specific application? We say this would not be something we're ready for as a society. Well, for instance, it, we really are rapidly focused on, on 8 billion people. Um, and we're not a particularly good technology for a lot of clinical populations. So folks that have profound motor loss, unfortunately, aren't well addressed by this. Uh, because we're actually using these motor neurons that are otherwise aberrant in a lot of motor pathologies. Um, it is a question we get all the time, are you going to use this for prosthetics, et cetera. Our, our belief is if we do a great job addressing common consumer scenarios, the benefit to clinical researchers and, and, and clinical solution uh, providers is going to be enormous. They'll get the downstream benefit from this. Rather than turning it on its head, which is where we've been in the neuroscience world, of trying to solve everything by the pathology first. And then saying, oh, if we solve the Parkinson's pathology, that will have some downstream positive feedback for the rest of us. 
I, I think we've gone way too far down that path as a, as a research um, uh, you know, directive. Uh, there's lots of other places where I think we're not ready right now. I do think we'll be a great solution right now for VR and AR. We solve a fundamental problem there that is not otherwise solved. It's not solved by mechanical controllers. I always laugh that the first Oculus Rift shipped with an actual Xbox controller. Why does that make any sense at all? They solved the problem of getting this crazy immersive experience into you, but did no work to get it out of you. Um, so let's switch, switching gears, we have um, in the audience for sure founders and also students from engineering departments, for example, or other or design sort of departments. So starting with founders, why is New York a great place to start a tech company? And what are the challenges as well? Uh, it's difficult for hardware. Um, and that's when we've gotten over, we have a phenomenal head of hardware product now, uh, but that took us a while to, to, uh, to recruit. Um, but if you're doing something where ML and AR are at its core, I don't mean you've created a PowerPoint deck and you're in the seventh slide and you say, oh, by the way, there's an ML part of this. I mean, really, it's the core of what you do, and it is the core of what we do. This is the best place to be in the world. I, I think it's, it's just lost that New York is the ground zero of machine learning. This is where the talent base is. The, the, the immense number of people with PhDs and otherwise quantitatively embedded in, doing quantitative work embedded in finance is enormous. They're kind of hidden from us, but they're here. And that's this sort of like bench level talent. In addition to that, we have these great academic centers that are producing some of the world's top machine learning talent, and in particular, computational neuroscience. So we have the Gatsby Center shared between NYU and Columbia and, and UCL. Um, and that's where places like DeepMind, the famous Google group, were spawned out of computational neuroscience. We have an unbelievable bench. We have no problem recruiting the highest end machine learning talent in the world here. They're either here or we can get them here, and we don't face resistance. It's easier to do it here than in Silicon Valley by far. Like I said, there are harder things to do here, like hardware, but the ML talent base here is off the charts. If I were doing any kind of ML company, I would be doing it here, no question. I see some head nods when you're talking about the, 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 the density of talent, ML talent here. Yeah. There was some head nods in the audience. Um, so you have a PhD in neuroscience. <clears throat> I did a PhD in technical degree as well. Um, I'm certainly not working in a lab anymore. Yeah. Um, what would you say to the researchers in the audience, in addition to their technical talent, other skills they should focus on if they want to work for a startup or a company you know, such as Control Labs? Uh, one of the big things I'd say is it, it's less about which skill, I mean, I'll tell you, like I did a PhD in neurobiology and did quite a bit of real biology. Um, I consider myself a pretty competent neurovirologist. I don't know that I'm using any neurovirology in what I'm doing right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, all the classic things about how to, how to scope a problem, how to measure your progress against a goal, whether or not you actually did this and in increased your efficacy through your graduate school career, you should always be sort of asking yourself if you're doing that. That said, pragmatically speaking, learn Python. <laughs> <laughs> don't learn MATLAB. Uh, learn Python. I don't care if you're a biologist, an ML person, whatever. Learn Python, because that's the, the heart of uh, most interesting research projects today. Um, and then last thing I'd say is fight your PI to get some commercial experience. A lot of you may be embedded in a lab that will not let you do commercial work. Fight your PI. Say you want six months off to go do an internship somewhere. Don't wait till the end of the run and then say, boy, I'm going to make a decision between doing a postdoc or doing something commercial. Because that commercial experience is going to be a bit of a shock to the system to you uh, if you choose to do that. Um, the people who have been most effective with us to date have had some commercial experience. It doesn't have to be deep, just go do an internship. Uh, but fight your PI over this. You're in charge of your own career. Don't do everything your PI tells you to do. Sorry, PIs. I wish I knew you 10 years ago, Rudin, when I was finishing my PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much and good luck to you. Thanks Thank you so much. Thanks all. Thanks.